In the end, John talks about that I see a new heaven. It's coming down from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for a husband. I hear a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with man, he will live with him. You have this escalation from the current situation to the eternal situation. We're always called to raise our eyes and look at eternity because this life is just a drop in the ocean of eternity. So all of the books of the Bible underscore that in red, if you would. Yeah, if you look at those last two chapters, it's amazing how it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. You know, the tree of life is there. Then you talk about the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 65 and 66. Again, you can't understand a book like the book of Revelation without understanding the Old Testament and all of those allusions to the Old Testament. We already saw that the beasts that are mentioned and and of course, new heavens and new earth. And you mentioned stars falling, not just one star falling, but you got in Revelation chapter six, you got a third of the stars fall from heaven and hit the earth. That language is, again, judgmental language that we read about elsewhere in scripture. And that's how you understand the Bible. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to go to seminary. I mean, all, some of that all helps. But it's all there in the pages of Scripture. In fact, you know, you and I have been discussing this almost for an hour and a half. And you think about it, we haven't gone outside the Bible to interpret the Bible. We use the Bible to interpret itself, taking the words of the Bible seriously, applying Scriptures with other Scriptures, showing how they were used in one context, and see how they're used in another context. This is how you do Bible study. Anyone can do it. Some are better at it than others, as in all cases. But we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. The Bible is the best interpreter of itself. Okay, so now I'm going to stump you, Gary, because we're (laughs) at the end of this, and so it's about time to stump Gary. Now, I'm just joking because you're not going to be stumped with this at all, but let me go on to quote just another small portion of the Olivet Discourse. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving up in marriage. Up to the day, Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what was going to happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. So here you have left behind very, very clearly in the all of the discourse. Here you have the rapture. How could it be more clear than that, Gary? (laughs) Well, it is very clear, actually, because the ones who are taken are the ones who are taken probably most likely by the Romans in judgment. And we know that they were taken. There were, again, Josephus says there were about a million who were killed during the, the melee, the overtaking of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple and all that. But there were many who were taken off into slavery, and you can see an edifice in Rome showing where the elements of the temple were paraded to Rome, and that I think the estimates are like 50,000 of them were, in fact, taken. So this particular passage has nothing to do with the church being taken off the earth. The ones who are left behind are the ones who are the survivors of this particular onslaught by the Romans. And if you go back to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 21, Jesus is told, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, it's time to get out of town. If you look at Matthew chapter 24 and Luke and Mark's version of this, this was a local judgment. You could escape this by going to the hills outside of Judea. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 24. You know, don't go back into your house those who are on the rooftop, and when's the last time we were on the roof, you know, in our day, we don't use our domiciles, you know, for entertainment. In order to escape this, if this is in the future, we would all have to go to Jerusalem and escape and go to Judea. This was a local judgment, and there were those who were killed and slaughtered by the Romans, and those who were taken away, that is, taken as slaves to the Roman Empire. Those who were left behind were those who survived this onslaught and continue to live and continue to preach the gospel. Let me move quickly to the book of Revelation. And this always struck me as I was memorizing this. When you get to the very first 
few verses of the book of Revelation, you find out that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything that he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So here you have in the prologue to the book of Revelation, you have the words soon and near. And then you have the dispensationalists who want to say, I'm taking the Bible literally, obfuscating on those two words. Soon doesn't mean soon, and near doesn't mean near. I went through in the concordance and list every instance of the word near and shortly and quickly found in the New Testament. And, you know, Hank, I know you'll be surprised at this, but you know what they mean? Near, shortly, and quickly. <laughs> every context that's what they mean. But all of a sudden, you get the prophecy, and they don't mean that. And so you got the book of Revelation bookended by the word near. You've got it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. You've got it in Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Now, what's curious about that is you go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Daniel is told to seal up that prophecy for some time in the future. And so many believe that what we're seeing in the book of Revelation is kind of the unsealing of some things that were revealed to Daniel, but that we're not told about. And you're supposed to you seal this up because this is sometime in the future. The book of Revelation opens that up. And these events were to happen, I believe, before the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70. The temple is still standing in Revelation. And you go on with this and you begin to see that that makes a whole lot more sense than anything that you can imagine, you know, in doing all this. That was Revelation chapter 11, that the temple is still standing. John has told them to measure the temple. You would have to posit a rebuilt temple, and the New Testament doesn't say a thing about a rebuilt temple. And yet that is, in fact, one of the focal points of dispensationalism, the need for a rebuilt temple. And you will find prophecy writers who believe there's going to be a rebuilt temple who will actually come out and say that there is no verse in the New Testament that says the temple is going to be rebuilt. And yet here are literalists claiming that the temple is going to be rebuilt, and yet there's not a single verse that actually says that. Isn't it a horrible thing when you think about this? I mean, when you think about the idea of a rebuilt temple, not only a third temple, but perhaps a fourth temple, when Hebrews talks clearly about the fact that the temple is no longer necessary because we have the temple in our midst. Jesus Christ replaces temple priest and sacrifice. And if we go back to temple priest and sacrifice, it's tantamount to trampling upon the sacred blood of Jesus Christ. So this is not an unimportant issue. I mean, this is an issue that the Bible drives home, I think, with great power and purpose because we recognize that Christ fulfills all the types and shadows. We don't need to go back to a temple. The ultimate temple has come, and we are living stones in that temple. Yeah, Jesus said, destroy this temple, the temple of his body, and I'll raise it up. And Jesus is talking about Jesus' body here. He is the manifestation of the temple. The temple of stone and everything in the temple, everything in the temple and the temple itself was a type of the true temple, Jesus Christ. To rebuild the temple would be blasphemous. But, you know, again, the dispensations always seem to have an answer for all this. And, you know, they say, well, you know, this is one of the reasons why the Jews are going to be judged again, because they're going to rebuild the temple and the sacrificial system and so forth. And I, I'm always amazed. I said, here you go. You guys say that the prophetic clock for Israel changed and, and stopped. And then we're living now in a parenthesis and a gap of a nearly 2,000 years. But God's going to redeem his people again. So, and I say, now you're telling me, so after the rapture of the church and 2,000 years have passed and God's going to redeem his temple, and we talked about this at the very beginning, so God waits, finally, 2,000 years have passed, and God's going to allow two-thirds of the Jews to be slaughtered again. And so how does this fit your paradigm? 
that God waits all this time to redeem Israel. And by the way, a generation that had nothing to do with crucifying the Lord of glory, that this particular generation, guiltless in terms of the generation that actually put Jesus to death, guiltless is now going to suffer another Holocaust. Two-thirds of them are going to be slaughtered. It makes absolutely no sense to me and to lots of other people who are finally getting out of the whole dispensational system. You've been listening to an excerpt of episode 104 of the Hank Unplugged podcast hosted by Bible Answer Man broadcast host Hank Hanegraaff. This episode is, Are We Living in the Last Days? And it features guest Gary DeMar, who is an author and end times expert. To listen to episode 104 in its entirety, please click the link in the description below. 